Welcome back to Top Bins, the show bringing you all the action from England and Italy. I'm your host, Matt, joined by my newly engaged co-host, Dom. Dom, how you doing? I'm good, man. I'm in good spirits. Happy to be here. Happy to be alive. You know? <laughs> That's a, that is happy a ringing that, endorsement. Ha- happy that I don't have to pay for an engagement ring any longer. <laughs> well, brother, you can start saving for a wedding. Isn't that fun? Um, Yay. Yay. <laughs> congratulations, Dom. Happy for you. Uh, it is the return of me as well, not to steal the spotlight, but uh, no longer oh, in... Come on, uh, man. No longer in the Midwest, back in uh, good old New Jersey. Uh, feels great to be back, celebrating our nation's birth. Just kidding. Uh, just swam in the pool all day. Uh, <laughs> so uh, let's let's get started here. Uh, we're going to do some transfer roundup, and then we're going to uh, do a segment that we'll be back with next week. Well, actually, no. We're going to start with a new segment. What am I saying? I can't even look at my own Google Doc. Uh, so we're going we're gonna to start with the segment. We're going to do it next week for England as well. I uh, just wanted to highlight the three teams that have been promoted. I think a lot of times, you know, People don't watch the second divisions of a lot of league, which is fair enough. Uh, so we're just going to do some some background information about some of these teams. So you at least know something about them, especially in Serie A, where not many people are watching Serie B, myself included. Um, so, you know, I, I wanted to, to give give the listeners a little insight into, into these teams that we'll be watching all this season and be rooting for to pull off a great escape, just like Salernitana did this year. Uh, first team is uh, Cremonese, uh, team from the North Lombardy region, uh, just like most teams in, in Syria now. Um, there's, there's very few southern teams, although we did get a new one, which we'll get onto later. But uh, back in Syria after 26 years, not a team that has had a whole lot of success in the, in, in the top division, uh, only been in the Syria a handful of times. Um, and, and 26 years is a really long drought, similar to Salernitana uh, that we got last year. And um, the, the theme with all these teams really is that they have some pretty interesting young players that I'm fascinated to see play at a, a, the, the top division now. Um, some players that were on loan from top clubs and, and returning. Some of those players went back. Um, so Zanimakia from Juventus, he had a really good year last year for them. Uh, one of their top goal scorers, uh, definitely important for them to, to get him back. Uh, they play in this like 4-3-2-1 or 4-3-3 a lot. Um, so sort of a, a more modern system, you know, you could think of with, with wingers and um the thing that concerns me about them is that anytime you get a team that's promoted, you'd like to see something great on one side of the ball or lead at one side of the ball. You'd like to see these teams promoted that are great at goal scoring or have a great goal scorer or that have a strong defense because typically you stand to lose about 15 to 20 goals scored when you get promoted and you stand to lose anywhere from like 20 to 30, you know, additional goals conceded. That's just the, the, level that uh, that you have to improve on um, and that most teams you know kind of suffer from is is you have that kind of attrition um, so you have to kind of plan for that and I look at Cremonese and I'm a little worried that you know they don't quite have um, don't quite have anything on either side of the ball that stands out to me um, I, I think it's very hard already for promoted teams to to stay in the top division but um, I, I am a little worried about Cremonese uh, returning one of their names is uh, the the violins uh, I <laughs> I love that. I'm going to be referring to them as the violins uh, all season, I think. I'll probably be doing a lot of this <laughs> uh, season. Pity parties with the world's smallest violin for the violins. Very nice. I thought I thought you, you thought I was going. I, you thought I was going. Ah, that's it. That's, that's, I thought you were expanding it. on that, but uh, nah. I appreciate it. Um, <laughs> they did lose Gaetano, who's, who's back at Napoli. I was a little surprised. Um, I'm not sure what Napoli's plan is for him, but that's another you know key player for them last season that I, I think they they could miss on. But um, you know they they went through um, you know in in second you know, in, uh, in Serie B. So they had a, a strong campaign. I, I don't want to downplay them too much, but we just know that the step up to Serie A is, is a, a steep one. And we've seen teams very often go straight back down. Um, and I, I am a little worried for Cremonese in that, in that regard, but we saw last year too, there were some established Serie A clubs that were in a lot of danger. Genoa a team that, um, you know, went down that I, I don't know that people really would have expected Sampdoria for a while, uh, were, were locked into a, a relegation fight and, and they could again this year. We know Salernitana just barely survived last season season uh, I wouldn't necessarily be shocked to see them potentially you know in the relegation circles yet again this year so you know I, I think in years past maybe you've had teams that uh, you kind of expect you know to, to be down near the bottom and and you know you you know that these three teams coming up are kind of a big but 
I think there's there's a few teams already, you know, established in Syria that that could have uh, tough seasons. You know, you still have Spezia who could have a you know a down year, of course. Um, and then you look at some of the other, you know, uh, you know other promoted sides. Even someone like Empoli, you know, who obviously had a, a really good uh, first season, but you know, you're seeing some of their talent getting uh, dripped away, and you know, you can see how sometimes that second season syndrome. So I will say, I don't think it's nearly like. A, just arithmetic three up and then the same three are going straight back down. Uh, but it is usually in most top leagues, two out of the three uh, very often go back down. It, it, it is rare for especially all three of them to stay up, but usually at least one or two of the three are, are, are unfortunately relegated uh, straight off the bat again. Yeah. The thing that worries me about this one is that they like, when I, when I look at rel- or newly promoted teams, I look for how young their squad is. And I look for how many, you know, you know, Serie A veterans do they have, you know, and you don't see a lot of either of that on this team. They have some young, talented players, but then most of their team is age 27 to 33, you know, somewhere in that range. And and none of those guys, you know, are really Serie A veterans or have been played top flight for a long time and, and, you know, kind of understand what it kind of takes to, to help guide, you know, the younger players in this new, new venture, because some of most of the younger guys probably haven't, unless there's someone like, you know, Luca, you know, Zanimakia who played with Juventus, how much first team minutes did he actually get? I don't know, but you know, th- that that's what worries me about a team like this is, you know, I don't know much about them. Um, it's been quite some time probably since they've been in the, uh, you said back in Syria after 26 years. Yeah. So like a lot of these guys, even the front office, you know, they don't, they don't know what it's like to, to deal with a Syria season. It's been so long. So, you know, this is a, this is a team to keep your eye on to see if they can make it out of the relegation battle because they're, they're going to be fighting for it most of the year. Yeah. So their average squad, squad H2 is a uh, 25.9, which is uh, 25.5. Sorry. It's not um, that bad. It's like kind of in the middle, you know, like uh, the, the younger teams are around like 23, older teams at like 29, if you're like mm-hmm. a Lazio, right? But, um, you know, like that's, you know, uh, and, and they're drugged down by the fact that they had a, a few, you know, guys that were that were really young playing a, a lot of heavy minutes for them. Um, but yeah, I, I, I would worry a, a little bit about this team. And, you know, having those young players, though, can be in, in some ways a benefit. But it's very often the case that we don't see young talent necessarily make that step up and really push on and improve. Um, you know, there's a reason that you know you, your prime is considered me you know, 25 and 29 you know year old range. Um, if you have you know, you a lot of guys that are more on the U23 side, uh, that does give me a little bit of pause in, in terms of thinking that you're going to stay up. But let's move on to uh, to Lecce, a team that we do have some you know familiarity with at this point. They've they've bounced up between the divisions a few times now. They're like the Benevento or, or Brescia, you know, that over the last few years, last decade, we've seen kind of bounce up and and bounce back down again and um it's nice to have another southern team in syria uh they are the southernmost team now right at the the heel of the boot in in italy um one of very few southern teams you know that are, that are in the top division salernitana uh, just barely hanging in there uh to, to give us one of our strongest southern contingents that we've had um so they're 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 taking over for that i will say the, the southernmost team, not a not a storied record a lot. You know, Crotone uh, now going down to Serie C uh, in a lot of issues. So uh, sometimes being that southern team can be a little bit of an issue. Uh, but yeah, so they're, they're back after two seasons in Serie B. The biggest concern for me is uh, they had Massimo Coda, who is like the... To, to use an analogy I think people will be more familiar with, he's like the, the Mitrovic of Serie B and uh, that he's great in the second division and just never really has established himself as like the top flight scorer. But if you have him in, say, the championship like you have in England or Serie B, uh, he scores a lot. He had 42 goals in two years uh, for Lecce. No longer with the team. He's with Genoa now. Uh, so Genoa are hoping to, to kind of capitalize on that and get themselves back in Serie A uh, under his uh, goal scoring tutelage. But yeah, I, th- I think you lose you lose a goal scorer like that and there's there's cause for concern as well. You know, one of their other top goal scorers too. Um, I, I'm a little iffy on, you know, he's, he's 36. Uh, I'm just not sure that he's, you know, going to make that step up. Uh, I'm talking about Strafeza. Um, he was one of their, their second top goal scorer last season and I'm just not totally convinced. If you're asking me to uh, to say, I'm sorry, he's 25. I was thinking that he was much older, but um, I'm not sure that he's, you know, going to carry this team, right? You know, when you had someone that was so very obviously uh, making this team, you know, 
score a lot of goals and, and, and improve in a lot of ways and, you know, ultimately win Serie B, if you lose out on that, that's that's one area of concern for me. Yeah, I mean, I, I, Lecce is always one of those teams to me that, you know, they come up, they have a couple players that kind of, you know, have themselves a decent season, but then they'll get scooped up by another team as they get relegated. You know, it, uh, I, I, I don't really know much about some of the t- some of the players on the team. I do see that, you know, they they brought up a couple players from their from their primavera. Uh, they have you know Gianluca Fabrota on on loan yeah. uh, from Juventus. Uh, they brought in another goalkeeper, Federico Brancolini, um, uh, and then I, uh, just recently uh, they brought in Asan Cisse, who I, I'm not I don't watch Zurich, so I don't know too much about him. He apparently had a great um, last season for Zurich, uh, but the the. The T on him is that uh, it wasn't until last year that he was good. He was kind of considered a flop before last season. And last mm-hmm. season, there was a much more like established system in Zurich, apparently, and, and he really thrived under that. Um, so I'm curious to see you know, how he gets on. He was a free transfer, too, so yeah. kind of low risk. They really haven't spent a, a whole lot of money yet. For Brata, I think, is an interesting signing because he's someone that you've heard uh, you know, kind of some some noise about from Juventus, and we've seen him play a little bit for them, and I think there, there's a potentially bright future there. So uh, in terms of talent and prestige, you know, he's someone that, I think people are going to be uh, really uh, familiar with. They also got Bobby Adekanye from Lazio uh, back in in January. So, you know, that's another player that I think could maybe uh, improve with this team. But yeah, I, I again, you know, they're, they're, they're one of the stronger Serie, a, uh, Serie B sides, right? Of course, you know, they, they, they win the division, but um, I, I would say defensively, they look very strong. Only conceded 31 goals in Serie B last year. So that's, that's a, a positive for me. You know, that's something that I think, you know, could hold over into this this top flight now but um you know outside of that i i just again i i look at the goal scoring right so you lose Cotto had 20 goals your next best scorer is trafeza with 14 then it's all the way down to uh, Di mariano with five goals um and then sort of just spread out from there amongst uh you know about like 10 other players so um that's that's a big gap to fill and i'm, I'm not sure that they've done quite enough yet to do that uh obviously i'm sure they'll be hoping cisse can can make up some of that ground and you know but they play in a 4-3-3 uh so we can look forward to that at least they did last year we'll see if they change systems uh this season um i'm looking forward to watching Lecce again i, I kind of liked them last time they were in syria um i like the colors too but you know, we'll, we'll see uh i like the southern clubs the southern club colors are always i think a little more interesting i think they kind of reflect like the more vibrant you know southern culture and style um, and let you, I think, lean into that pretty well. I appreciate it. Just know you, you got a you got a fan of me, let you. My, my favorite uh, southern team is uh, Palermo, who just got bought by the City Group. Yeah. So you know they're they're back into Serie B. So we could see Palermo back in Serie. A. That'd be great to Palermo. The pink you know, and black. Palermo, uh, you know, kind of a a holdover from I think some of the glory days of Serie A and I think a lot of people think of Palermo <laughs> still when they think of, of Italian football so um, it would be nice to have Palermo back maybe mm-hmm. we'll see them back next season you know Lecce you know again a, a, a kind of a yo-yo club over the years um, they'll be looking to establish themselves but history has shown that they have not and it's hard it's hard to make that leap I don't want to be too critical but uh, we'll see this one uh, this team has caught a lot of attention uh, for various reasons uh it's monza uh berlusconi's new team uh they're in milan's backyard uh very very close to the city of milan just on the outskirts um first time in syria as well uh not a team with with a ton of you know top flight history. They do have quite the financial backing, especially when you have Berlusconi. But uh, when, uh, you know, I don't need to tell you when you have Berlusconi uh, owning your club, it can be a little hectic and it can be a little insane. Um, the, <laughs> They've been very active this transfer market. Well, it's interesting because they have some names that you know if you've watched Syria over the last few years, you've definitely. You definitely recognize names. They just signed Alessio Cragno uh, mm-hmm. from Cagliari on, on loan, uh, which is is fascinating because you know they already had a pretty established goalkeeper last year. But they've got uh, Andrea Ranocchia. Uh, people will definitely be familiar with him from Inter. They have Gaston Ramirez, who bounced around a few Italian clubs. You know, was was good for Sampdoria uh, within the team. They they signed uh, Stefano Sensi from Inter. Well, I thought like his first six months at Inter looked really good and just never recaptured that. So I'm looking forward to seeing if he can he can get back to some of that form. But I I don't think that's a bad loan move at all for them. Um, and I think what I like about them too is we you know sometimes and we talked about it with some of these these teams already that are getting promoted you lose players that you loaned in from like you know top division clubs that go back to their parent club or, or whatever maybe you sell a player or two 
largely they've kept the core of this team together. If you look at like their top minute getters, um, pretty much all of those players are returning plus the additions that we just mentioned. That to me is a a sign that I like. I, I like to see that within a team. I like to see that they're not scrambling to fill, you know, four or five positions. Um, I like to see some continuity and I like to see, you know, just some some filling in the gaps and getting some better players, you would assume, um, in some of these loan moves that they're making uh, to help kind of fill out the squad a little bit. So I, I kind of like the business that they've done. Um, they're not like amazing players. I think Ragno could be very good. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that he will be the starting keeper, but uh, mm -hmm. I don't. I'm not going to speak out of turn because I think I don't know that for sure with Monza. But someone like Sensi, I think, can definitely play in, in the Serie A in the midfield. I think he's totally capable of that. Uh, Gaston Ramirez, I, I think, is is still capable of doing that. Um, and yeah, you know, Ronaldo, I'm not totally sure. He, but you know, he does have leadership. He does have a lot of experience, and that can be important. And we've seen that over the years that that can be crucial to keeping a team up, to keeping them together, um, and and to to give them that focus. So, um, I'm I'm curious with Monza all the way. Yeah, uh, yeah, and I, I think there's sure. a reason too that they've they've been the intrigue. It's not just because of Berlusconi and the money. I think they they have uh, something a little interesting. And everyone likes to see a team that's been up for the first time, you know, ever. Yeah. Berlusconi, Galani, all these guys, you know, putting together this new team right outside of Milan. So it's it's very it's very interesting to see. It's going to be crazy when when they play each other. Um, it, it's crazy also to me that their goalkeeper, their uh, on loan, is the most expensive player on their team. His market value is crazy compared to everybody else. Um, the second highest is Sensi. So you know they're trying to throw money at at some at some people that will that are looking for another chance trying to, you know, you know, still blow up in, in, in Syria, like a guy like Sensi, like you said, like his first few months at Inter seemed like he was going to be a great fit. He couldn't stay healthy. Maybe, maybe a team like this can help him uh, get back to his, to his, uh, to his old form. Um, I hope not because he's on loan, but you know, nevertheless, um, yeah, I'm I'm very excited to see how these guys play. They they probably are coming in with the most pressure on their shoulders compared to the other two teams, be, just because of their owners and who you know backs them. But um, yeah, this is a very interesting dark horse team. I'd be excited to see if they can stay in in Syria after this season. Yeah, so they, they have a Portuguese two, duo too that I, I want to highlight: Pedro Pereira and Danny Malta. Danny Malta was uh, their their top goal scorer last year with 11 goals in all competitions. So. Um, those two, you know, are young as well. They're both, uh, they were both 23 last season and, um, you know, we'll, we'll see how they get on. And again, we like these young talents come up we've, we've seen over the years that that can, that can really, uh, help you in a lot of ways, but I think they have a, a pretty decent blend as well of, of experience. You know, the average age of the squad is 26.9. Um, that's pretty good. You know, again, right there in the middle of kind of where you want to be. I think you have a, a good mix of young and, and older players. Um, but, uh, you know, and, and some guys that can be crucial for you, but, it's always hard. Again, I, I think that's that's the big takeaway for, for any promoted team. It's very challenging. Um, over the years, I, I think we've been surprised, especially in England, uh, but you've seen it again with Empoli last year in Serie A. You, you've seen some of these teams get promoted and immediately have you know good success you know you've seen teams that you know, finish even like top half of the table or, or right at mid table and that's that's a huge marker for them um but it's it's much more common historically for at least you know again two of these teams uh, to go straight back down but like we said syria the, the i would say the the bottom six of syria is pretty fluid for me uh, you could kind of tell me any of those six are, are going down and i took a i took a look at the odds i couldn't really find odds on relegation I thought something was crazy. Juventus has like plus 190 odds to win the title. They're they're like level with Inter and a little ahead of Milan. I was shocked by that. Um, especially, you know, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about Juventus later. Uh, but the flux that that club is in right now, I don't know how they're like the, uh, I guess just because of re name recognition at this point. But I don't know how anyone could be saying that Juventus are odds on favorites to win the title this year. I, I think Hell no. I think oh, that's a that's a bit of a stretch for me personally. That. But that's what listen. That's what the odds makers are saying. That's it. Who Vegas? The people that don't watch the sport, probably. I'm just telling you what they said. That's it. I'm just reporting. Oh, Juventus! Juventus is uh, not gonna not gonna slip up again. Can't can't be can't be this time. I was also looking at the kits for this season, and I, I just I was reminded of how much I hate Juventus uh, kits this season because the Jeep logo too has like the lightning bolts in it. I 
hate it. And I don't like the way the... Um, so they finally brought the vertical stripes back. They, they did away with that for a little bit. Um, and, and people didn't like it really either, where they just had like the half white, half black. Um, the vertical stripes this year look very strange. I, they... they <laughs> Not like a fan, um, but there's a few really nice kits. I really like the Atalanta's. I think third kit uh, looks very clean. So there's there's some good ones to look forward to. Roma looks really nice again. New Balance kits, always always really clean, really nice looking. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, let's get into some transfer roundup. We're going to start with uh, some things that are confirmed that we that we know for a fact have actually happened. Right? We're not just going to uh, speculate like we will in a few minutes. Uh, but Lukaku officially back. In Milan, he's officially back in Inter colors. Um, that's a fascinating, fascinating uh, story <laughs> because, I mean, Christ. Um, Inter have made out like bandits in this. They sold him for a, a big profit, a big chunk of change, and now have loaned him back for pretty cheap. And, you know, like it or not, I, I think we've seen that he can succeed at Inter. Obviously, it's under a new manager and uh, a slightly different system. But um, if, if we get, you know, Lukaku like we got in the title winning season the the player that was MVP of the league I think uh I think that's a good signing you know I think I think it can certainly work out for them the big thing obviously is managing all that encircles Lukaku and you know we saw at Chelsea that it was just uh really uncomfortable interviews that I think derailed the season in a lot of different ways but um Inter also signed Mkhitaryan and Onana uh these have been Onana has been rumored for a very long time uh Mkhitaryan the last few weeks um has been heavily linked and they were both confirmed as Inter deals as well so so good free transfer business by them um in that regard I think I think the Mkhitaryan signing kind of eliminates the rumor that Dybala is on his way to Inter as well. Morata came out and said today that they're happy with the attackers that they have, and Dybala is not yeah. part of that. Um, yeah. Now maybe that could be you know there's some news about Alexis Sanchez maybe maybe being gone and maybe they're trying to move on. You know someone like Jeco. Uh, we'll see. Uh, but yeah, I mean as it is, they're, they're pretty stacked as it as it stands, uh, and I, I have to agree with him. They, they really have plenty of attacking options. They still have Correa, too, who they signed last year. Um, and they have some some young players, too, that they you know I think they'll be looking to, to get some minutes at. Um, yeah. There'll be plenty of opportunity, too. I think that's, that's what we all need to keep in mind. It's going to be such a more uh, hectic season uh, because we obviously have the, the, the World Cup in winter, which is, which is unusual, but that's going to make uh, fixture congestion uh, a lot worse for these teams. Um, so having depth is actually a a great thing and, and it's her again have plenty of that to go around so um what are your thoughts on Lukaku though because I I just I looking from your perspective obviously as a as a Milan fan in in some ways it's funny but in some ways it has to be a little worrying because last again last time he was here he was dominant with Inter and and led them to a title yeah I mean yeah knowing knowing what he was able to do uh is obviously worrisome but uh, he, like you said, you made a big point about it being a different system, and, and with it being a different system, can lead to issues. It's not the same team, right? Inter sold a lot of those same players that he played with prior, so he doesn't have the chemistry with everybody on the team. He obviously has it with some people, but he is also a guy that like that ends up arguing with his teammates a little bit, kind of in the same mold of like what Ibrahimovic does. Um, kind of, he he demands a lot. And then, you know, if it doesn't go his way, it kind of gets in his head. Um, it's funny, from the social media aspect of everything, um, I was, like, looking, and some Inter fans are already, like, complaining that he's working out, like, his body and not doing, like, drills. They're like, <laughs> you know, they're like, oh, he, he's, you know, preparing, like, this is American football instead of working on his first touch. So, you know, it, 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 Lukaku was an absolute demon, you know, a couple of years ago in Syria, but you know, that, that, that same kind of momentum can, you know, the rug can be swept out from underneath him. And, you know, we see the Lukaku that people, you know, make memes of online all the time. Uh, still has G the partnership with Latura, at least, you know, Latura yeah. is still there. And, and it's a scary um, combo. I can't lie. Right. Like, that's it, that's it, what Murray and the second half of the season, Lautaro was much better, much more improved. He, he looked a lot more confident. It, you know, if you get those two linking up again, you know, if Gosens again on the on the wing too, who I think is is every bit as good as, as Perisic. Um, obviously, you don't have Hakim anymore, but Dumfries filled in very well. Like I just, I don't know. I think I think Inter for me, you know, just as it stands now, it's hard for me to not think of them as the favorites for the title. Um, I think yeah. again, both Milan clubs will probably be in that discussion, but Inter have done Inter, good business. Inter holds and, and the I think, edge. Yes. Inter holds the edge because of like what you just said, 
right? right. The business that they've been doing, the the lack of business that Milan has been doing. There's still a month though, you know, and that's yeah. why I think there's still plenty of time, you know, before the, the season even starts, before we even kick a ball. But right now, as it stands, I, I think Inter are looking a, a scary team. Um, speaking of scary teams, uh, building in some arms race here, uh, Richarlison off to Spurs, leaving Everton. Um, it's a big move, I, I think, in, in terms, especially for Everton's perspective, right? Because he's one of their best players. Um, didn't make a huge profit on him either. I think it was around 50 million pounds is what they sold him for, but they had bought him for 35 and, and a lot of bonuses, which we can assume a good chunk of those probably got triggered. Um, it's it's a it's a tough loss for Everton in terms of you know talent. For Spurs, it's interesting because now you know you have a really competent front three, uh, which I think I don't think it's hyperbole to say is one of the better front threes in the league. Uh, simply because you have Son and Kane, uh, and then Kulusevski had a, had a strong second half of the season after uh, his his loan deal uh, to Spurs, and I think that's a really competent and good front three, and certainly capable of being you know Champions League uh, team. And now you add Richarlison to that mix, who can play pretty much across the front three um, in in any position, which makes him great as like a rotation piece. I. I go back and forth with this. I think he's a good player to have if you're Spurs. I didn't like the price they paid for him, but also when you just think of what you're paying for an attacker now, that is just kind of the going rate. You know, 40, 50 million pounds is not is not that crazy anymore. I think we kind of have to adjust to that. Even your know, players going for 60 and 70, is just, that's just what it is now. That's what you have to pay. Um, mm-hmm. But I, I, I'm not wild about Richarlison. I, I don't think he's like this elite, elite player. But I think, you know, again, if you're talking rotation player for a Champions League team, um, I think he can do that. He can definitely fill in and start. Um, and I, again, you know, fits, I think, what Conte likes, which is an attacker that isn't afraid to do defensive work as well. Um, and he can score some goals. Um, but, you know, we'll, we'll see. I think it's really, it's a bigger deal for Everton, which I, I don't think is saying much. But um, to me, this is this is really negative for them because, again, he was one of their top players. And hilariously, uh, he's getting banned for the first game because of the flair that he threw. Um he should have somehow gotten banned for that in the, like the two or three games that they had left in the season. I don't know how they just now were like, ah, oh, we got to get him for that one. Um, I think Everton will be happy though. Cause should he have been banned probably, probably could have been relegated if they had missed Richarlison for any length of time, but uh, he will be banned for his first game as a yeah. Tottenham player. I think the scary thing uh, with regards to Tottenham is not, you know, not that they signed Richarlison, but the fact that like, you know, the board is backing Conte for the players he wants to go and get. And when Conte is able to go and get the players he wants, you'll, you can, you'll see what happens. It's, it's scary for the league. You, uh, you saw it in Serie A. He did that. Inter signed all these players, huge market, and and they end up winning the league pretty convincingly. So, um, you know, that's I'm, – I'm curious. Like you said, there's one month left. If, if the board is backing Conte like this, he already has, you know – like you said, a viable front three with, with now some depth. Where else is he going to, you know, spend spend some money with this war chest he has, uh, and 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 bring in the players that he needs to be successful. If if he can do it, it it's kind of scary. I hate to I hate to give Spurs their flowers, but you know. Yeah. It's well, it seems scary. like they still they still want like a top level center back, which I I would agree with, and they're still looking at a, at a right back situation. Jed Spence has been linked to them a lot, who I think would be a good signing. So, um, yeah, plenty of time still for them to make improvements. But what they've done, you know, they got Richarlison, they got Basuma, uh, Fraser Forster is a, a good like kind of rotation option for them. Perisic, um, and then you still have Benson Curry and Kulisevsky, which bedded in really nicely. But now you'll have a full preseason. I think that's too really important because. Conte is a manager that I think really benefits from having more time with his team. Um, and that's, you know, that's that's been drawn out a lot over his career. So now that they have a full preseason with him too, and he's getting it, like you said, some of those signings that he's clearly interested in, um, that's good. But yeah, Conte too, you always have to back the guy. Uh, the, he, is, he is a, uh, I, I don't want to say like fickle, but um, he, he knows what he is worth and he knows the players that he wants. And if he doesn't get them, he's willing to just like walk away from the situation. He's willing to just yeah. leave. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, conversely, for Everton, they sign uh, James Tarkowski uh, on a on a free deal, uh, leaving Burnley. Not a bad signing for them. It's not a, a wow signing either. Um, sort of in the mold for Everton over the last few years of, of kind of the the budget signings on the fringes. I think are actually they're they're smarter moves. But outside of that, not a lot of movement so far for Everton. And again, we can't forget this is a team that just escaped relegation. Um, need to start greasing the wheels a little bit. But their financial situation is still 
not fantastic, but I do like Tarkowski. I think he's he can be a good like starting center back for them. Um, they don't have, I would say, the best options at center back as it stands. So uh, he he slots in quite nicely there. But um, you know, losing Richarlison, maybe Calvert Lewin this summer. Although it seems like he's probably staying. Um, this is the team that needs to start moving forward a little bit. And I don't think the answer is Harry Winks, by the way, uh, who they've been linked to quite a bit from Spurs. So we'll see. Uh, this one, Calvin Phillips confirmed to Manchester City. Um, I don't know that we talked about this as much, but it, it was it was a done deal, uh, confirmed, posted on the, you know, we talked about Calvin Phillips a few weeks ago. You can go back to that episode. I don't remember what, what number exactly, but he was one of our five players within the Premier League that, that could move this summer. And we did a little uh, package on him and what type of player he was. I was not engaged. I, I was not like in love with him then. I was not, you know, thinking like this is a player that I th- he, he's 26. I think he's still a limited player. Clearly, Manchester City see something in him. He was linked to them even then. Um, clearly, they see something in him. I'm willing to bet that Manchester City are smarter than I am. Uh, that's <laughs> that. I think that's totally reasonable. But I, I just don't see it. I and I guess I'll just have to to wait and see it. But I, I, I don't, I don't think he's that amazing. Um, He's he's gonna end up playing like that Fernandinho or like uh, Busquets type of role. But they have Rodri already. I yeah. you know like he's he's it's, kind of he doesn't really have. It's not like Grealish where you could convince yourself they spent a lot of money on this guy. And Phillips' deal wasn't that insane either. Uh, but you know you could at least convince yourself that like Jack Grealish is a player that will could start meaningful games for City and, and is, is is a player that can probably still grow a bit. Calvin Phillips is twenty six, and I don't think is. City He's not has, cracking their three midfield. City, City have stupid money to pay for rotational players. Like, that's that's all it is. It's like, here's a depth move that we're going to use, like, in the thick of the season. When we're You're not allowed like to say three. that. You're not allowed to say that, Dom. You can't bring up that City spend money because other people spend money, too. Don't uh, you know? Yeah, You're not allowed yeah, to say yeah. that. Oh, excuse me. But, um, you know, when they're playing three games in the middle of a week and, and Pep needs to go roll to the C or D team, like that's when Calvin Phillips will step on the field. He won't have his debut for the club, like in an actual like game that matters until like January, probably. So, you know, it's, it's going to be very, it, it, it's weird. It's definitely weird, but like, like I said, city just have stupid money to spend on players that barely get any playing time. Because yeah. all the players that do get playing time just stay for the most part. And they just succeed year after year after year right now. Yeah, it's it's just tough to see him cracking necessarily that, that starting midfield. Yeah. But as a rotation yeah. option, again, similar to Richarlison, it's like, you know, you could do worse. And again, maybe City sees something that I don't in him. Uh, but I was never really impressed with his passing, which is a huge part of, of you know, being. But I will say there there's definitely some similarities between his role and how he played with Bielsa and how, you know, uh, like Pep wants like that that sole like kind of pivot defender uh, midfielder to play. Um, so I, I think there's some similarities there. And if you can you know survive and play well and thrive under Bielsa, I think there's there is definitely some carryover to how Pep likes to play. And I, I think that might be some of the angle here, uh, just like the how he understands and reads the game. But we've seen also that it takes you know, some players some time. Even Rodri, who was great last year, was not amazing in his first season for City. You know, it took him some time to adjust. So. Um, we'll you see. Gotta, you got to have the competition in, in all the different, you know, positions in practice, you know, to try to bring the best out of all your players. So, you know, maybe this is uh, try to maybe this is a move to give kicker uh, or Rodri a kick in the backside to be like, hey, like we, we know you did well this year, you know, like got to keep improving now. So it could be that or like we just said, it could just be, you know, just here. Let's just throw some money at a, at a quality player that, you know. We don't have to worry about in that position when we're rotating. Yeah, yeah. So we'll uh, we'll see how that gets on. That's that's it for like the confirmed stuff today. No other big deals that have been uh, like. I'm just thinking ones that have been like announced by the club already. I know there's some that we'll talk about too in this segment that um, are pretty much done. But you know we have to wait on the actual announcement for. Um, so this is this is the speculation section. Maybe the more fun tantalizing stuff. And uh, I know you and Kyle touched on this a little bit uh, last week when I wasn't here, but and you dismissed it. But uh, it is picking up some steam. Cristiano Ronaldo uh, not showing up currently for Manchester United training, apparently because of family issues. 
maybe that's true. Um, but I, I think it's a little bit of a coincidence that apparently he's asked to leave the club and now he's not showing up for training. I don't know. I think family those... issues, aka he's arguing with his wife about what city they want to move to. I, I think I think it. I think those two things are related. Is all I'm saying is that a few days before uh, he apparently asked to leave United and now he's not showing up for training. I don't know. To me, those those things. They're, they're, they're connected in some way. They're, um, they're trying to find Cristiano Ronaldo Jr.'s next academy that he's going to join in. Is, is, it, is it worth, you know, putting him into this team? That's what they're fighting over. They're not, you know, the, Ronaldo's, Ronaldo's leaving, just not to any of the teams that he's been linked with right now. Yeah, so the, the two teams that he's been linked with the most, Chelsea, and there was some buzz even uh, like that, that Kyle had brought up with you that um, – they had had a meeting with his agent, and there seems to be something to that. They're, Chelsea and Bayern are the two teams that have had, it seems like, actual discussions uh, with Ronaldo's agents and, and his team about potentially that transfer. I don't know what that would look like, though. Um, I, I just, it's hard for me to imagine it, but it's hard for me to imagine him, too, not playing in the Champions League at this stage in his career. I think that's still where he sees himself, and we saw he scored 18 goals for this team last year. Um, you can definitely, I think, make an argument that he was part of the issue at United last year. And I think Juventus fans would tell you that he was part of the issue with Juventus. Um, but he does still score goals. I think he would be a, a big signing for lots of teams still, and, and they would be happy to do it. But um, call me skeptical here. If for United, it's, it's, it's about as bad as it gets, though, because if he has this discussion in like May and maybe like early June, this is less of a, of a problem, but now you're sitting, by the way, players are reporting for, for training like this week. Uh, we are exactly one month away from the Premier League starting. They start on August 5th. Uh, it's like coming. It's like, it's, a, it's happening now. Like you're, you're back and you, you want to have, especially with a new manager, you want to have this team kind of settled, um, having probably your biggest player in terms of profile, not even probably your biggest player in terms of profile and your leading goal scorer last year one out of the club as you're due to report back for training and you only have a month till the season starts again and the striker market as we know is inflated right now it's going to be very expensive to replace him should he leave and even then a lot of the the big strikers are off the market um you know there, there's not really many other options to go after uh so it would be a disaster i think um in in some ways for ronaldo leave i also think it could maybe be good for united should ronaldo leave so um it's it's kind of a double-edged sword here yeah um I just, I don't know. I find I find it hilarious. Manchester United fans on Twitter are so deluded in it as well. It's you know half of them are like, he's not leaving. He's not. He's he's staying. What are you talking? And then you know uh, other people like you mentioned, uh, Ten Hag has started the, you know, practices and stuff. And and somebody you know posted a video of them doing like a very basic like you know like dribble and, and like back heel like handoff like drill. He was like, yo, he's got these boys working. <laughs> I was like, yeah, what? <laughs> it's some of these people you can tell have like never played the sport. It's like that was like that was just a, a drill. I don't know, man. Like that was just that that really. If that's what it takes to impress you, no wonder you thought Ole was at the wheel. Like you know, like it's just like that's that's all it takes. Okay then. Um, yeah. Sick. So I I don't know where where United are headed now, but I know that um, it's it's. A, it's a fucking mess. It's, it's not. It's <laughs> it's a, and it's bad too because obviously you still have the Frankie De Jong so uh, nonsense uh, carrying onwards now. Um, there's all hit pieces coming out from Barcelona about him or what a terrible person he is because he doesn't want to take a pay cut uh, or something. Um, so bad. It's it's He's so getting rough the to see. Usman Dembele treatment, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but even worse because Frankie De Jong like wants to be in Barcelona. It, like, I, it's it's awful. Um, Christian Eriksen has apparently agreed a deal to join United. This is a good signing um, for, for United, although, you know, age profile isn't amazing, but he's still a fantastic creator, as we saw when he played for Brentford last season, uh, one, of, one of the top uh, chance creators in the league, despite only playing half the year. Um, he's the type of midfielder that they, they certainly could use. However, I don't know exactly where he's fitting in the midfield. I'm so curious to see United play this season because I, I just want to see how this is going to work. Uh, because we saw that this team was still unbalanced last year. It was one of our big, big criticisms of United last season was that they needed probably that more, you know, another central midfielder instead spent money on Ronaldo. And, um, you know, I think there was, there was some concern that the midfield was still unbalanced. And I think that's shown through last season. That still, to me, looks, uh, you know, if De Jong gets done right, you know, and again, this is all with the caveat that there's still a lot of time left in the transfer market. But um, as it stands, it's still a team that is not, I would say address some of the issues that they've had in the last few seasons. 
no uh, potentially may not have a striker uh, uh has m- many wingers you know that are very offensive minded uh sancho rashford you know etc deciding christian erickson to a team coached by somebody who while at iac used to run a 433 a lot would you think that maybe Christian Erickson becomes kind of a false nine type player? So they get an extra midfielder and then, you know, put more of the scoring outlet on their wingers. That would no, but I, and that would also work if they had wingers that were scoring Jaden Sancho, not scoring Rashford, not right. scoring. I mean, like it's, this is, it's so strange because United last off season too, it was like, they had like this, like plethora, especially when they bought United, uh, Ronaldo, that it was like, they have like six forwards. And now Cavani is gone. Mm-hmm. Uh, we know obviously everything that's happened with Mason Greenwood, you know, not, not a part of the, the team of the future. Rashford had an abysmal year, um, but maybe he rebounds. It's not inconceivable to me, but he looked like just a completely different player last season. Jaden Sancho, I think, had uh, like a good like month and a half near the end of the season um, under Rangnick. And, and I, I saw, we saw some flashes from him again, but he he did not have, I would say, like a sparkling year. Uh, we know they love Alanga, but I... I is he like the guy? It feels very Adam Adanyana's eye kind of stuff here, where it's like he just had like some flashes and he's clearly the best. Like, let's pump the brakes, you know? Like, and let's let's not say he's that this the is best. let's not say that this is the guy now that's like saving the team and and going to be like the step for them. So, I don't know. I I I don't hate Erickson as like a signing. I think it's fine, but I just I don't know if this is like necessarily should be the priority for United. Uh, it's still. A little bit, uh, I don't. Know. It's still a little bit interesting to me to to see this, and and I don't know. I <laughs> I don't see him just, taking Bruno's spot, but it, which is the only place in the midfield that I could see Erickson playing kind of the same role. I don't see that necessarily, um, and it's interesting. Yeah, like you, you mentioned that weird. IX played like the four three three. They did play four two three one quite a bit under Ten Hag as well. Um, so I'm wondering. You know, if there's just like some some extra work in there for Erickson somewhere, but uh, we'll see, we'll see, we'll see how it works out, um, and that seems like it's going to be done. This is another big one. Delict apparently leaving Juventus. Um, Chelsea seem like to be the main suitor. Bayern Munich also very interested in Delict, uh, which would be great for them because Bayern struggled defensively last year. He'd be a good signing for them. He'd be a good signing for anyone. I love Delict. I think he's great. Uh, I think it's it's a shame that he's probably leaving Syria, but this brings into question I think a lot for Juventus and. What a a dour transfer window it has been for them so far in in a lot of ways. Um, if they lose Delict all of a sudden too defensively, I I don't know where this team is at because you lose Chiellini, who wasn't you know obviously a big player for them anymore, but was certainly a, a good leader and still played some minutes. Um, you'd be relying a lot on Bonucci, and I'm not sure that that's necessarily the path you want to be going down at this stage in his career, at least you know in terms of like if you want to be winning Bonucci the title. Bonucci combo, gotta love it. <laughs> Right, and I, I just think it's 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 worrying to me that that Juventus are kind of in this position because I they don't have a ton of like defensive players, yeah, they're, especially they're, center backs. You know, if you lose the Ligt, that's worrying to me. They're in this position and they're looking to bolster their attack with signings instead of you know get some defensive guys. If this is the case, it's very very offsetting if you're if you're a Juventus fan right now. Because I like so they they sign. Uh, Di Maria has apparently agreed to join, which I like. I like that, and I, I said that a few weeks ago when we talked about Di Maria. I think any team that gets someone like a year to two deal, I think, is doing some smart business because I think he's still a very valuable attacker. Um, and I think what's great about Di Maria, too, is not just what he himself gives you. I think what he gives Chiesa, too, because uh, we have to remember Chiesa is coming off an injury and will likely get reintroduced this season. I think it's good that you have an attacker that can compete for his spot, so you're not rushing Chiesa back. You're not playing him like 90 minutes too soon. Um, that you have someone to fill in that gap. I think that's I think that's a really good thing for Chiesa and for this season and for his future that you're kind of now maybe a little more inclined to to take your time and ease him back in as you should. And there's there's less pressure on him uh, to actually you know come back and immediately be the impact player that he was. You're gonna have a, a full off season now for them to to kind of reinvent themselves. And you have Lahovic uh, to to kick on next year. And I I thought he was still pretty good for Juventus last season, but. Again, you know, you, you signed Pogba apparently too. Uh, I think the midfield looks okay. You have Locatelli, Pogba, McKenney. I think that's a fine midfield. I think that that's that is a a Champions League quality midfield. But 
the defense is where you're, you're losing me a bit. And that's so strange to say about Juventus. That's so strange to say about an Allegri coached Juventus at that, uh, that there's, I think, legitimate question marks. And there's a lot of time left in the transfer market. That's a caveat for all this. But um, I'd be a little worried about Juventus's defensive direction right now if they're losing to Ligt. No. I don't, I don't. We're so used to seeing it, but I think that's also because Juventus has also relied on the loyalty of some of their center backs for so long. I think they're dealing with, you know, this is, this is a weird situation where the, the, the center back that they bought thinking about the future of the club wants to leave now. And that's, that's very worrisome. Um, you know, cause Delict is still, what is he? 23, 24. Uh, Delict is like 22. <laughs> He's yeah, insanely like, young. Yeah. So like, this is, this is really, really bad. When you think about it, like it was supposed to be him and Bonucci for a few years. And then when Bonucci decides to move on, they have somebody else that they can reload and just keep it going. And it, the, the, the wheels are falling off the train, I guess. Um, Hell, I could care less, but <laughs> uh, I will sit here and total my thumbs with a big smile on my face seeing the Juventus train, you know, get derailed and watch them end up back in the Europa League like they should be. But um, nonetheless, let me get my bias takes out of here. Yeah, so uh, we'll see what happens to Juventus. They're also have been linked a lot to Zaniolo. Uh, this has been happening for a while, but it seems to be picking up some momentum enough that I think it's it's worth mentioning and discussing at least a little bit. I'm I, I'm confused by this. My I life. think I like Zaniola a little more than most people, but uh, he didn't have his best season for Roma. Granted, he's he's coming off again, you know, an, another ACL entry, but um, he had some good mm. moments, but overall was not not like if you're asking me like. Pellegrini Zaniolo, it's Pellegrini, you know, like, he, uh -huh. and obviously he's younger. He has that on the side, but um, for the price too, it's, it's around like 50 million euros. Apparently they, they want for Zaniolo and, and apparently that's getting a, a little advanced now. Um, that'd be confusing to me. I guess he'd be a good option for like the, the more attacking uh, midfield and maybe playing him on the wing. But um, again, you know, if, if you're, we just had this discussion about maybe not focusing as they should defensively, you're going to spend that kind of money on a player that I think is a little bit surplus to you. I don't, I don't know that Juventus really needs Zaniolo. And I, at that price too, I mean, you're buying him like pre ACL tear price, pre like bad season, yeah. right? Like I, it's, you're kind of like paying exactly what Roma wants you to pay. And you're not really getting like, it's not like a Chiesa situation or a Vlahovic situation where yes, you're paying a premium for this player, but you know that this is a player that's going to come in and make a difference for you. I'm not like totally convinced it, 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 that Daniel is. Even funnier to me though, because I know I know you mentioned Chiesa because he'll give you the results, but he's also a very injury prone player, and we've seen it. So now, why would you then pay premium for another player that is also going to be sitting on your medical beds? You know, you know, the more you use him, and and that's the worst case scenario for Juventus. They put all this money out, and then let's say Chiesa and Zaniolo both get hurt next season. And they're out two of their main guys. I mean, it's it just doesn't make sense to me. Um, I, I don't know anybody who would want to sign Zaniolo right now. Like, I know he was rumored with Milan as well, but for the price Rome is asking, and then the player you're getting, like, yeah. If, it, if anyone's asking Milan for more than like 25 mil, they're like, we that is too rich. That like, is sorry. too much for us. <laughs> Zaniolo, I know you're 23. Free, free signings only. In, two, uh, two ACLs? How, how about a loan for two years and then maybe buy? Let's loan with an option to healthy. buy for 8 million. Uh, yeah, let's, let's see if you can stay healthy, Roma. Let's, uh... <laughs> best we could do um that's all we got for for today's today's episode i just wanted to, to bring this to you because this episode was brought to you by Binio board Binio is the next big tabletop game for your man cave slash she shed think paper football meets foosball and you've got Binio. Binio board is a game and lifestyle brand based in phoenix arizona and their goal is to provide the highest quality boards and a true brand experience Every part of their boards have been tested time and time again for the best possible playability so that every Flickr's experience is a positive one. You can bring the world together with Bino and hear someone's story from the other side of the pitch. You can right now, this second, today, tomorrow, preferably today when you're listening to this, you can go to BinoBoard.com and use our code BinoUSP, B-I-N-H-O-U-S-P for 10% off your order, including the newly launched limited edition Ultraviolet Board and Team USA and Team Mexico merch. That's good. Bino USP for 10% off your order at binoboard.com. 
Uh, we'll be back next week. We'll be doing the same little segment, uh, but with the three promoted teams from England. Uh, we'll be talking about transfers. And then, Dom, I, I don't know if you know this, but I mean, then we're only a few weeks out from the season. We're going to start previewing. Preview we're going to start previewing some of these teams and, and talking about that. Uh, so look forward yes, to sir. that in the coming weeks. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I just mentioned it to you. We're uh, exactly a month away from the start of the Premier League season. It doesn't quite feel that way. And then uh, the next weekend, Serie A is back. So uh, we're gonna have we're gonna have club club talk back very soon, which is exciting. It's exciting to have it all back. Um, it it didn't feel like a very long break at all, but I'm I'm very pumped for it to be back. Uh, but until we talk to you next week, we'll talk to you next week. <laughs>